Okay, very good. Thanks everyone for taking the time to uh, spend with us this afternoon. We're going to talk about soil health. And I'm Dave Stark. I run the, the ag business for Holganics. Uh, I'm actually a PhD, not soil scientist, but molecular biologist slash biochemist. Spent my first career with this little ag company called Monsanto and uh, retired from that. And uh, now uh, couldn't stand being retired, so uh, work with Holganics. So uh, just to get a little bit of um, my perspective. Probably the first three decades of my career, we didn't really, and this is an embarrassment, uh, think much about soil. We thought a lot about the genetics or the seed we put in the soil and the things that we put with the seed to help protect the plant and help it grow, but um, not much about the soil. Fortunately and thankfully, that's changing. There's a lot of awareness around you know, the difference between good soil and bad soil. And you can see some pretty dramatic differences here between you know, something that's nutrient rich, which of course is built through a combination through time of mostly roots interacting with the microbiology, the bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and such in the soil, versus you know, what happens when we don't take good care of the soil in the, the lower left corner, where it uh, kind of looks like asphalt. Um, it's rock hard, water runs off of it. Uh, it has very little, if any, organic matter. Uh, it's basically just a solid support that uh, can hold roots that we have to constantly feed and water. And I found this quote, uh, this is a professor uh, from Ohio State who's published a lot of, in the soil health area. And I think he sums it up well, when devoid of its biota, and that means the microbes, the bacteria, fungi, and protozoa, the uppermost layer of earth ceases to be soil. Uh, I guess we call it then dirt. Um, so we all know the value of soil and, and, and we're seeing more and more what people are doing to um, help build and feed the microbes in soil. So, uh, and I hear an awful lot about this now, you gotta feed the microbes, feed the microbes. So we do things like we, we don't till or we do reduce tillage a lot with cover crops. Um, the gentleman here, that he is spreading manure. And I think if you had a sign on the back that said, stay back at least 300 feet, most of us would respect that. Uh, we do other things like biochar, humic acids, sugar products, all things that are good to feed the microbes. But that's only half of the equation because what we're assuming is all the microbes that the field needs are already there. But a lot of things happen that actually disrupt the microbes and even kill them off. Some of those things we do, like uh, when we till soil, we tend to disrupt a lot of the fungi. Uh, we make the soil too rich in bacteria, which I'll talk about why that's bad uh, here in a little bit. Some of the, the chemicals we put down like fumigants, uh, fungicides, even when we over apply nutri nutrients like nitrogen, we can disrupt and even kill a lot of the beneficial microbes in the soil. But there's a lot that happens we have no control over, like winter and, and freezing. And uh, the picture on the upper right, so I live in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, I'm surrounded by this. And I've been seeing this now for several months. It's just flooding. And uh, it's hard to not find a field that doesn't have standing water in it. And I'll ask guys, so, you know, what's it like, you know, when that water drains? And, and what I hear commonly is it smells awful. That's bad. That's the clue that the beneficial microbes in that soil have been killed off because they've used up all the oxygen. And it takes, you know, depending on the soil type and all about 48 hours uh, underwater. And a lot of those beneficial microbes that need air to live will die. So what's left are the microbes that don't need oxygen, the anaerobes, and they smell. Um, and they also tell you though, uh, that the soil is now way out of balance. By the way, a lot of the, the bad microbes in soil that cause different root and plant diseases are the anaerobes. So now they're taking over. 
because if the good microbes aren't there to keep them at bay, the bad ones take over. So the soil that's been flooded, and there's a lot of this, it will eventually come back, but not right away. So if you're gonna plant into this, I don't care if this is turf, if this is a corn or soy crop or something else that's coming up that's yellow and struggling, part of the problem is you don't have the good microbes anymore. And we can see this in different crops. So again, we were on a, a call earlier today with, with some people in the turf industry and they're talking about turf that's really yellow because it's been underwater. Um, again, a lot of the nutrients washed out, the beneficials gone. Uh, different syndromes, for example, in corn, like fallow corn syndrome, yellow corn syndrome, you know, in turf, it could be especially a sand-based turf that a lot of the nutrients have been leached out. That can happen in a farmer's field too. But, but a lot of times, if you do a soil test, you can still see there's nitrogen, phosphorus, and such in the ground. It's just clearly not going to the plant. And part of that is because the microbes that need air, that are the beneficials, they help keep that nutrition in the root zone, and in a chemical form the plant can take up. And when they're not there, our fertilizer dollar is not working as well. So basically what's happening is uh, we're putting down fertilizer, it's just not efficient. So look, even in a good situation, data shows that about half of fertilizer we apply doesn't go to the intended plant. Um, so when the good microbes are, are, are really knocked back, even less of that is happening. So you, to complete the equation, we want to feed the microbes, but we also want to add them back. So if you look at that center picture, and this is a, you know, something I see more and more of in agriculture, it's where uh, crop debris from last year's crop is in the field. There's a cover crop planted, which is great because you always want something growing on the field if you can. There's a lot of nutrition there for next year's crop, but not a speck, not a single molecule, literally, will be available to next year's crop unless bacteria, fungi, and protozoa break it down into its basic chemical forms that the plant root can take up. That whole process, by the way, is called mineralization, if, you, if you're curious. So I keep talking about bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and even some beneficial nematodes. So I've got pictures of them. Um, here in the upper left corner, all those little tiny spots and, and, and such, that's a picture of, of bacteria. And bacteria come in all kinds of different shapes. So this is just an example. In a good teaspoon of healthy soil, there will be billions with a B of bacteria. Um, there will be thousands of species of bacteria, and bacteria are really the workhorses. They're degraders, so they're going to be really active in breaking down the manure, the grass clippings, uh, the plant debris, the cover crop, whatever you've got out there, breaking it down into those common chemical elements that the plant can then use the next season. Um, Below that, this is a picture of one type of fungus, a mycorrhizal fungi. There are other fungi that are important, like trichoderma. They live along the surface of a plant root, and they eat bacteria and other things that might uh, try to eat the plant roots. So they're, they're good. They're predators. Uh, penicillium, uh, it's such. Fungi are also degraders. They're breaking down that plant material, really good at it. They also help solubilize nutrients that otherwise are in the soil but they're in a chemical form the plant can't access, especially things like phosphorus in the micronutrients, iron, uh, calcium, et cetera. Now the mycorrhizae, you can see they're the real light feathery stuff in between the plant roots. They're tiny, so they can get between soil particles that a plant hair can't. So they effectively make the root area 100 to 1,000 times greater because of their size, they're so small. So they find water and nutrients that the plant can't access. They also, interestingly, and we're starting to learn more about this, they connect plants to each other. So they really help a field, whether that's a grass or a forest of trees or a field of corn, talk to each other. And by, this is done, of course, biochemically, that if a predator or something that causes stress enters one part of the field, 
it sends a biochemical signal throughout the field that says, hey, get ready. You're going to be under attack. Turn on those genes. So it's kind of like the internet of uh, the soil. Now, in the upper right-hand corner, that's a protozoa. You can see it's surrounded by bacteria. And, and they're predators. They just eat bacteria and eat them like crazy. And, uh, and not all nematodes are, are bad. There are some that are good that are also predators. They don't eat the plant roots. This is a nematode in the bottom right corner eating another nematode, one that might normally um, uh, feed off of the plant roots and sap it of its energy. So I show you all this for a reason. Every microbe type plays a role in the soil. And this diversity is really important, really important. So if you're evaluating different microbial products and you want something that's generally for soil health, go for diversity. So I'll give you an example with nitrogen. The bacteria, for example, they live typically within one inch of a root. And when you apply fertilizer, they're going to grow on that fertilizer. They're going to use it as food which is great because they keep it within a half an inch of a root, which is where we want it. We don't want it in our rivers and streams or up in the air. We want it in the ground next to the plant roots. The problem is bacteria need a lot of nitrogen. They're nitrogen pigs and have a really high nitrogen requirement. They can actually tie up nitrogen and contribute to things like yellow corn syndrome because we have too many bacteria in the field and not enough of their predators. But the way God designed this to work is their predators, as the bacteria grow on the organic matter, the crop debris, and your fertilizer, so do then the fungi and the protozoa. And they have a very low nitrogen requirement. So as they eat the bacteria, it's too much nitrogen for them. So they're constantly expelling it, and they expel it as ammonium and nitrate. What are the two forms of nitrogen your plant root likes to take up better than any others? Ammonia and nitrate. All this happens within half an inch of a root. So this cycling is really important. We need all of the microbe types to really make this work. So diversity, it completes the equation. So the Hoganics Bio 800 Plus product is all the diversity a healthy soil needs. It's over 800 species of beneficial bacteria, fungi, and protozoa. They're all aerobic, so they need air. Um, and all the different types of, of microbes that, that you might be buying individually or, or piecemeal, like the phosphorus solubilizers, nitrogen fixing, mycorrhizae, trichoderma, plant growth promoting, et cetera, et cetera. They're all in there. Plus there's food that help the microbes get growing immediately because our microbes are alive. They're not spores that need to germinate. They're alive, they're active. It's why we keep the product refrigerated in storage because they're ready to go. And that's really important because science has shown that if you have a whole consortia of microbes like this that already naturally grow, to, grow together, they will feed each other, protect each other, and can actually make a change in the soil, which is what we want. They're bringing all the beneficials back. So I'm going to talk, um, and I like talking more about what customers do than showing a lot of data. I'm going to show you some data, but I think customers are actually the best data. So Holganix started in lawn and landscape. So unlike a lot of uh, players that are now in agriculture that usually start in agriculture, uh, this was a lawn and landscape company. Actually, uh, the founder and CEO was the biggest customer of the product oh, uh, probably 10, 12 years ago, uh, back when he ran a really uh, large uh, company in the Chesapeake Bay area that was treating lawns. And uh, they passed some restrictions on fertilizers and he wanted a competitive advantage and started playing with different products and found that, that this product actually worked. His lawns looked greener without having to add as much nitrogen or, uh, or uh, phosphorus. So through the years, some of the, the best turf managers in the, in the country that have been repeat customers and, and know this product works. And I got to tell you, you know, my experience at Monsanto, I was pretty skeptical about soil microbes. We didn't really talk about them. We had an effort in them, and I was never really overwhelmed with it. Um, 
But these are the guys that told me, no, I really do cut my fertilizer. Uh, the roots are deeper, so yeah, I really don't use as much water. The plants are healthier, I really don't use as much fungicide, which is why I thought um, I really need to learn about what's going on in the soil. Uh, so here's, here's a data slide. Um, if everything I said about the microbes is true, that it's keeping the nutrition in the root zone, we should be able to use less fertilizer. And we have a lot of data and customer experience on this. And it depends on the fertilizer type, the soil type, what you're trying to accomplish, et cetera. And it's not that the plant needs less fertilizer. Remember I said about 50% of fertilizer never goes to the plant, but microbes keep that fertilizer in a chemically active form in the root zone. So what's happening is more of the fertilizer we're spending money on actually goes to the plant that's intended, less is wasted in the environment. That's why we can use less and actually accomplish the same or more because we have better efficiency. So here's, here's just some examples. So I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. I, I've uh, been to Muirfield Village Golf Club, which is you know, outside of Columbus. And uh, th these are customer pictures, all of these customer pictures. So upper left corner, that's Muirfield Village in the middle of August, several years ago, before the President's Cup, which if you're in golf, you know that's kind of a big deal, that your course can't look like this when the cameras start rolling and the pro players from around the world are, are on it. So uh, uh, the superintendent there used organics, and you can see how well it grew in within 30 days and uh, pretty dramatic. Um, if you go to the right, uh, that middle picture is dollar spot disease. Uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates third baseline several years ago, they had a player that uh, was sensitive to some chemistry, so they weren't applying fungicides. Now dollar spot is a disease, it's also a nutrient deficiency. So you can see how well just three days after using the Bio 800 product, we're getting more nutrition to the turf and you know, good microbes fight bad ones. That's where we get antibiotics and such. And you can see that how it's healing in. Uh, the ornamentals in the top, those are the same age. So look at the difference in the size of the plant and, and the root mass in particular. Here, this also came from another customer uh, just several weeks ago. And this is a course that hosted the PGA uh, putting championship. And you can see what the superintendent has said here, and I'm not going to read it to you because uh, that would be insulting to you. You can all read, but he sent this in unsolicited. I mean, look at the difference in the roots. He said the net from one to five inches in three months, and uh, even offered that if you've got questions and you want to talk to him about how to use organics, get in touch with him. So we we really appreciate. We we get things like this all the time from people, and. Um, and again, this is the best data that we can generate. And then, you know, we have another slide here. And actually, this superintendent, you can see what, what, what Shannon is showing here, uh, how the cation exchange capacity, really how the soil can hold on to nutrients has increased with the use of organic and how the organic matter, which shows that when it's being degraded, the end product is humus and humic acid, which is why cation exchange capacity increases. That's really the type of organic matter we want in our soils is, is the humus. So I'm gonna switch a little bit now into agriculture. I'm gonna talk mostly about corn, soy, and wheat. Um, we've done trials in a whole number of crops. So if you've got an interest in something else, you'll see my contact information at the end, just let me know. Uh, this is a data slide, basically showing two very different types of soil. Some of the best ground, God created for corn in north central Illinois versus uh, west of where I live, which is higher in clay and, and not quite as rich. You can see we're getting a nice bump in yield in both soil types. Uh, we tend to see a little better result in poorer soils. But remember 2018, where we still got over 10 bushels, western Missouri was probably under the worst drought in the country. I'm <laughs> so different from this year. Um, and, uh, and so that was a, this was not uh, irrigated, this field, which is why the yields were down. So we look at, at roots. 
And you can see uh, this is from that trial in Western Missouri last year, about two weeks after planting. And you can see on the left, the control, look at the difference in the roots on the right. This is one of the most visible differences with the microbes. You remember I said that, um, you know, microbes consume fertilizer and such. Plants, because microbes in turn feed the plants, plants will spend about 30% of their photosynthetic energy to feed microbes because they get so much more in return. One of the things the microbes do is they send out um, chemicals that are like plant growth hormones that induce rooting. And I don't care what you're planting, whether it's a tree, a shrub, grass, or corn, or soybeans, whatever, you want faster root establishment because that's gonna help that plant survive summer stress and eventually find more nutrients and deliver higher yield. So look at the difference between the two. And this is a picture also from last year from another part is from Indiana, just a little Northwest of uh, Indianapolis. This is a customer picture. And uh, first of all, you know, the treatments on the right, look at the length of the ear and how it's filled all the way to the tip. So no doubt there's more kernels, more, more grain on that ear. And look at the difference in root mass. Remember to build soil. So we go back to my first slide, roots and microbes. Roots break up compaction layers. They allow air channels because we want air into the soil. They also allow water to penetrate. Roots secrete food to attract microbes. And the microbes plus the roots then help glue particles to, of soil together to build that soil structure. So if you want to build soil, you have to have roots and microbes. I mean, that, that's necessary. The organic debris we leave on top, whether that's manure, grass clippings, you know, corn uh, stalks, whatever, that's all great and that contributes, but most of the action is below ground. Soybeans, same kind of deal. Uh, this is my, my data slide. Uh, this is Western Missouri. We see you know, three to seven bushels, to, you know, depending where people are. More customer pictures. So in the top, this is uh, from North Dakota. This, this particular grower, he was hailed out, and so he replanted his field in the middle of June, and then uh, went out just before flowering, 